Welcome to episode two of the Plows Bros podcast. Joined with me is my co-host, Sam Govan. How are you doing tonight, Sam? Hello there. Great, buddy. How are you? I'm doing great. And I, of course, am your host, Matt Mellish. We are looking at Mando season two premiere. It was a mind-blowing episode. We are going to be talking about that in a couple minutes. But first, let's just hop into some Star Wars news really quick. Did anything yeah. really happen this week, Sam, that's worth talking about well since we last recorded we had a little bit of higher public news that's the, the publishing initiative starting in january so they've been doing little leaks as the season's been going on looking forward to the spring uh, so it seems like we're going to be getting uh some stories based around the nile which are the, the main villains have been released this week and they're a bunch of pretty much space vikings is what disney has been saying so we are expecting the things that the jedi fear the most so i'm not sure what that means what do you think that means matt I don't know, because you would think that what the Jedi fear the most is something more likened to the Sith. It just feels like more of a threat because they deal with the exact opposite ideals of the Jedi. They are selfish instead of being selfless. They cling to jealousy and revenge as their fueling motivators. And those are the people that would sway others to acting in a darker fashion, I feel like, not space Vikings. I think it more or less disrupts trade in the galaxy more than anything, and it's a threat that the Jedi have to go and deal with because they are the peacekeepers of this time. It's not like a war is happening. You would think that would be the Jedi's greatest threat, like what we see in the Clone Wars, because it changes the Jedi ideology. It creates mistrust within themselves to be able to lead the Republic. I don't know. That's just how I feel about it. What about you? Well, I think that it is because they have talked about how we are going to start out the storyline with a great calamity is what they're calling it. And so I, that Starlight Beacon or something like that is like a hyperspace waypoint and that's going to get taken out more or less. And they've released that. That's going to be in like the first chapter of the main, the first main book. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's a time where they need these beacons to travel through hyperspace. You can't just plot a course. You can't just go straight from Tatooine to Alderaan. Like you have to, you have to have these jump points. And so they take out one of those beacon stations, then I think that is kind of like what the main threat is. So it's interesting to see what that is. They look really cool. I think that I, I'm excited to see what they look like. I'm, I keep thinking about, you know, the uh, villains or the pirates in Star Wars Resistance. Yes. <laughs> they have like the modded together ships and like have all that stuff going on. I yes. think that would be really cool to try to like, if it was something more along those lines, or, like what yeah. they look like as far as, yeah. It's just kind of thrown together parts. But I guess mm -hmm. what is the difference between space Vikings and pirates is also a question that I have. Are they kind of like pirates that we see in Resistance or even kind of the way Hondu Anaka acts? Or are they looking to conquer? Because I feel like that's the difference between pirates and Vikings. Vikings are the ones mm -hmm. who go to different places to make the land theirs and to take it over mm -hmm. rather than just to kind of steal and then salvage the parts for money. Yeah, yeah. And I think it'll be interesting. I'm really excited. Like I said, the last show, I already pre-ordered it on Audible, the first book. And then so I'm excited to see where that initiative goes. January can't come fast enough for me. So I'm excited yeah. to see where we're going. Yeah, I'm excited too, even though I... I collect all the books, but I never have time to read them, both those in the comics. I do my best. Uh, we have a, a tight schedule here in the Matt Exactly, and that's what we have this we have this podcast for. We can talk to each other about the things we've read and then catch each other up. So, exactly. And the, and the viewers, and you're more than welcome to, you know, read along with us. So Of course. And then course. Uh, next big piece of news this week, uh, I think today, HasLab announced that they have backed 13,000 supporters for the Razor Crest. Was that, that their that, initial goal? So their initial goal was, I forget, they, this is tier three. So they've pushed past two tiers and that, those two went really fast. So the first one was the escape pod and the second one was the, was the child with the pram. And today they, they unlocked all four carbonite blocks. So it's the mithril, the grodian, the woman, and whatever the guy looks like, George is. <laughs> and uh, those four. <laughs> the next step is the stand. So they'll, they'll state tier four will be the stand. And then after that will be a Jawa on the three and three quarter scale with a knife and what is it called? Mudhorn egg. So it'll be interesting to see what, if they actually get to tier five. I don't know when the cutoff date is, but there, a lot of people are back in this thing. So yeah. 
I mean, if I had $350 sitting around and I collected action figures and I wasn't as into Lego, I would totally buy that just for display purposes alone. My question is, did they have all of these tiers set up ahead of time or are they just kind of making it up as they go along? <laughs> I honestly <laughs> We're believe We're going to do the job with like, egg. Oh, I think I honestly think that they were like, oh man, we didn't actually believe, like we didn't think anybody was actually going to get this. So then here we are and people would just keep buying it. And they're like, well, we have to find a new reward. We have to push more people. So, because Jabba Sail Barge didn't get this much. Jabba Sail Barge unlocked, unlocked one tier. That was also $500. So we'll see. But yeah, it's kind of like uh, this weekend, I'm going to buy the Razor Crest from Lego because they have a VIP special going on. Nice. I really want to haunt the Haunted and Carbonite the keychain that they're on, that they're releasing. They're actually going to take more of my money, but you know yeah. how Lego is. The metal Haunted and Carbonite keychain is pretty cool. I wish it would have been a figure, <laughs> not just another keychain, but it's solid metal, right? Yeah, and that's why I like it. I think it's really unique. And like I've heard other people complaining about it, but I'm I'm pretty game for it because I have an old Loki on my keychain, an old Loki <laughs> mini fig that looks very. I've had it since seventh grade, so I'm for ready wear. to ready to trade it. Exactly. Yeah, it's been <laughs> ten years. I'm ready to trade it in. Any other news you want to go over, bud? Before we jump into Mando season two, I don't think really a lot happened this week because of the premiere of season two of the Mandalorian. So, you know, let's just let's just hop into it. Let's just sounds good, pal. Uncovered the greatest thing about the episode, <laughs> Sam, which is the cameo of Malakili. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> what did I tell you? We called it. I had you to, called it. <laughs> I had to, I had to, honestly this morning. I watched the episode. I had the day off. My girlfriend went to work. I rewatched the episode and was doing the thing where I was pausing every once in a while just to check at Easter eggs and stuff like that. The scene where they're burying the explosives the first time they catch the Kray Dragon. I paused and there's some guy there with it. I was like, holy cow, that is freaking Malakili. He made it. They're, they're like, the books are real. Even though Cobb Vance right there and he's a book character. It's Malakili. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, so, I, uh, I agree. I, I didn't catch him the first time until you sent oh, me the yeah. image. But on my second watching with my mom, because of course I have to watch it with her as well. I was game for it. And you can see him in the background of a couple shots throwing some explosives. But and the does camera he... lingers on him. Yes. Does he make it out? I don't know. Maybe he gets caught in the in the crate vomit or the crate whatever. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to check Wikipedia in like a few days and see yeah. what they say. What was your experience just starting off with, uh, with the episode today? I assume you probably stayed up for it. I did stay up. I did stay up till three o'clock in the morning, but I didn't watch it at three because I was filming some TikToks and I had some other things to do. So what is that, by the way? What are you Apple drinking? Cider. Apple really cider. Apple cider and uh, uh, eight days a week from Southern Tier Brewing Company beer. So Pretty good uh, combination. You should mix them together. So you're yeah, learning how to mix drinks on our... Uh... <laughs> Please don't, please yes. don't mix, mix these two, but I, it's, it's fall and, you know, pumpkin season. happy Halloween. I also have a giant bowl of candy right here. Ooh. So you should hand me some candy, Sam. <laughs> through, it, it, it'll be, it can be like Ray and Kylo. I'll just drop, drop a Reese's Pieces behind my back. And I stayed up to watch it and I watched it about four o'clock in the morning, you know, cause that's normally the time I go to bed five o'clock ish. My, my sleep schedule is the weirdest. A lot of people don't understand me, but that's okay. I still had the volume up pretty high, even though my parents were asleep. Play the episode. Immediately, we got that nice recap when we didn't start on Tatooine immediately. Because I, like you said last week, thought we would be starting there. I was like, okay, this is where we're going to start. Let's see what we have with that more or less run down looking planet with the fighting, the, the Gamorrean Guard brawl. I thought the opening was epic. Slowly transitioned into Tatooine. I was multiple times getting up in my chair to cheer and just go wow even though I was watching it by myself and I had no one to turn to <laughs> to say that's Boba Fett Boba Fett where still watching it by myself I loved every second of it and I'm just gonna let this go now this is my favorite episode from the series so far it's solid when did you see it who were you with did you like it immediately so yeah, I'm filming from a remote location somewhere in New York right now. I am Sam is uh, in a bunker. We were, yeah, exactly. Yeah, prepare for the next week. Uh, no, but I'm up here at my girlfriend's house. So I was told that we we couldn't wake up at 3 a.m. So we we slept until like eight, and uh, we watched it before she had to go to work. And um, 
the whole time it was I, I was in the same boat as you i was like oh man we're at the graffiti planet already like i was like wow this is the opening shot of the trailer and now it's the opening shot of the actually the season yeah. so you accept it and you keep going with it you're like okay this is what we're gonna get yeah oh yeah and i was like perfectly fine with it even though i know somewhere deep down inside he has to go meet that weak way the one thing that's kind of annoying though is they don't put the episode title on disney plus but then they put it on the show like i'm already 20 i'm 15 minutes in the show and you're telling me the title of the episode like what does it really matter if i saw what, 10 minutes ago or now see I it mattered for me it mattered for me because it was at the perfect moment because us Star Wars fans know when it says the Marshall, what that means. Because if you've read the Aftermath novels, that's what is referred to when they're talking about Cobb Vanth. I will say that when I, when the, <laughs> when it ended, when he said, oh yeah, we have to go to Tatooine and find the other Mando. I was like, oh, okay. And then the, then the title screen came up. I was like, holy cow. Holy exactly. cow, the Marshall. She's looking at me like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's the Marshall. And then she, and-, and Didn't then, you read the then, Aftermath novels? The interludes <laughs> of all the Aftermath novels? <laughs> when also, they go to Freetown? <laughs> yeah, and they didn't call it Freetown here. I was actually genuinely happy though that he pulled back in and Amy Sedaris' character was back and that he met with her. I actually thought her acting in this scene was better than the one in that season one. I really liked it. I cringe hard when she's on the screen, honestly. She's she's one of those characters that is just so campy. Not Grief Karga campy. He, his camp is good camp acting. This is too campy for me. This is Horatio Sands as the unnamed Mithril for me. The same level <laughs> where I well, cringe when she's on the screen. I'd much rather have her than the bartender from episode four last season. The one that acts like you're at Galaxy's Edge. And he meets Kara in the bar on that, what is that play? Sorghum? When he's, yes, uh, when yes. He's yes. And, See, I was fine with her. Oh, really? I hated her. I really didn't like that character. The way I just the acting, and like to me, that was too campy. You're right, 100. percent I was just gonna say it does feel like you're at the Galaxy's Edge bar and getting a fuzzy tauntaun. <laughs> Another story for a different time. Exactly. Exactly. But that was a moment, like you said, where I got up and I cheered because I knew what that meant in the grander scheme of things. You know, the fact that they did that first episode, dropping that oh, yeah. bomb, and then, of course, we'll get into it, but the Boba bomb, it allows me to believe anything that we were talking about rumor-wise last time on our show. All bets are off. Yeah, and with R5 coming back in, I, even then I was excited. I was like, oh man, they brought R5 back, and he was just a little tiny cameo in the last one. But, like, she makes it like clear that it's R5-D4 this time. Yes, which and, was cool uh, to see, and to get an actual... Uh, map of the planet was nice to know where things are located i'm sure they've released that in the past in books atlases and stuff like that but it was nice to see it in you know a more solid <laughs> visual format and then him going across the dune sea and interacting with the tuscans again i thought that was oh yeah okay you know he has a good relations with the tuscans whatever mm -hmm. and i just thought that was that and then going into freetown i was like holy cow when Cobb Vanth walked in. I was like, are they going to kill Cobb Vanth right off the bat? He doesn't right have here? a helmet on. Right here. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you don't even have your helmet on, you dummy. The whole episode, I kept saying that to Katie. I was like, uh, why doesn't Cobb Vanth have his helmet on? He has a Beskar helmet. I understand they probably, so that like the average viewer doesn't think, oh, this is Boba Fett. I would agree uh, with that. It was, it, was, it was interesting. I think Timothy Oliphant, I'm really glad his character didn't die because I think he did a really good job as a Cobb Vanth and told yes. a really good story. No, I agree. And I think the reason that they didn't have his helmet on too was because of who the actor was that was playing the character. I think part of that was just a, a great looking dude on the screen playing an awesome character from the novels. Just having that, knowing that they drew something from the novels and actually retold the story visually was really nice. Seeing that sand crawler come up, I'm like, Yes, this is actually <laughs> what happened in the books. This is the exact way that I imagined it. Yes. Although they do well, kind they, of retcon a few things, I think. I think you would be able to explain that a bit better than I can. Here's the thing, folks. When I read a book, I forget what happens in that book after a month of reading it. I just remember like the key moments. And the Sandcrawler was one of them. But going into Freetown or coming out of it, I think something was wrong there between how that character is introduced in the books than what we've seen. So he is introduced, he's in the sand crawler at that point. It doesn't say like they saved him or anything like that. Okay. So he's in there and it just deals with the whole transaction that he's buying acid spocked armor. That, that's pretty much it on that, in that sense. 
the thing that was a little bit different was the whole Freetown thing. They when he saves Malakili, I believe in book two, uh, he when says he goes they back. need. To be, yeah, he goes back. Well, it, this, I think that the chapter starts off with Malakili running through the desert, being chased by bandits yes, or something like I that. I remember that. And then he's totally saved right. by Cobb Van. I and I think that at that time Cobb Van says that he needs they need Malakili because they're raising animals of some kind, and that they have a hotlet that most importantly they're raising to take over Jabba's place. So that. But that wasn't reference was interesting, but I overall that the character of Cobb Vanth was in it was, I'm just so blown away that that character was ever in, in something like this. Kind of like the Sith Acolytes from that novel series going into Rise of Skywalker. Like mm -hmm. that, like that is just crazy to me that they're doing all this stuff and actually trying to make a weaved in, you know, storyline, which is, it's amazing. It's extremely cohesive now. And the show, like I talked about last week, is bringing everything together. It feels like it's bringing all the fans together. It, it, you have the fans from 1983, 1980, who saw Boba Fett for the first time on the screen, thought he died in the Sarlacc pit, and their minds are blown that he's back in 2020 in HD quality. I love seeing the armor in HD quality. I can't get over that. The detailing on it looked phenomenal. And then you have the book people the novel readers who really like all the other media from star wars and what they're producing at lucasfilm and then you have you know people from clone wars that can look at the crate dragon design and think wow that looks a lot like the zillow beast they must be cousins or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> like it just feels like this yeah. mesh of media and it really excites me going forward oh for sure for sure and that's that is what's really is very interesting thinking about that, what they can do, because like you said before, that seems like it's been two different universes where we've been, I read something, I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Those, these characters did that. And oh, well, you know, like these characters won't show up again. And, but it's good to have them in that universe. And like we talked about in the last show with, with Aftermath and like Snap Wexley being pretty much yes. two different characters and like Wedge being his stepdad and not really caring about it in Rise of Skywalker. Like that kind of stuff was, was rough, but this is kind of, stepping a new foot in the new generation. So I, I mean, I I'm very interested to see where we go on from here. But what I mean, did you think of the crate Dragon? I mean, it, it's a little different than what, what it was in Legends, but what did you think of it? I thought it was perfect. I didn't know what it was at first. A part of me was like, <laughs> is this just going to be a ton of Bantha stampeding the town? <laughs> or is it going to be something else? I didn't know. And then when I realized that the ground was shaking, I'm like, can Sarlax move? And then I realized what it was just before it went for the Bantha. Well, rem remember in uh, the Galaxy's Edge comic, they did have uh, the, the Sarlaccs that moved, so. Yes. Yes, I do remember that. <laughs> that was such a weird comic. So strange. There uh, are certain things that I don't need explained. That is one of them. <laughs> but it's still cool to see other Sarlaccs, Han Solo catching a Sarlacc and delivering a duck on there. Well, Sarlaccs in a way remind me of Rathars anyways, so. It doesn't as much change my perspective. It does in a way, a smaller way, but I don't know. What I did like, going back to Cobb Vanth really quick, though, before we get to oh, Craig yeah, Dragon yeah. and everything else, when you first see him on the screen, for me, I knew it's not Boba Fett, and I think that other you know, watchers would agree because of how it doesn't look like the armor completely fits him. He looks kind of disheveled in a way. I, I can't describe it. I can't put my finger on it. But that's because it's not his armor. He's wearing somebody else's yeah. clothes. And it just doesn't look right. I like that touch, though. I think it should feel a little off. On a second watching, I like that Mando slowly realizes, okay, this isn't a Mandalorian. This is somebody that I need to remove from the scene. I need to take his arm. Like he goes back into his beliefs from the way, right? It's not immediately somebody that he thinks that he can trust. It, the thing I talked about, like with him returning though, I think they built a, such a strong relationship across that. Oh yeah. Uh, across that whole event, which I, I'm really interested to see if he comes back in some way. But I don't really see any other reason for them to come back to Tatooine, even, unless the next week's is on Tatooine. Maybe it is. I don't think it will be. Pers I mean, I think it might be him leaving Tatooine. Maybe. Maybe the pit droids do a terrible job in repairing his ship, and that's why it crashes later on. <laughs> but I think they definitely kept the door open to see more Cobb Vanth by the way they ended the episode. Even they said, I hope I see you again. Yeah. How can they not run into each other? one more time yeah. at least 
or they're yeah. setting up more of a rebels thing where man is making all these friends all over the galaxy and then in the end he needs them to all come together and help him <laughs> i see that happening again and i will oh. say really quick i have to put this out there i just have to you're gonna laugh this episode reminded me a little bit of the great divide from avatar the last airbender with the earthbenders both hating each other and then they come together in the end between the tuscan raiders and the freetown people well it was just like such a good super like uh western trope of like the cat like i've heard other people talking about the cowboys and indians and like the yeah that kind of thing and I think that is a great way to put it is like the, the town folk trying to deal with the natives that they don't understand. I think that, that was really cool, but definitely you could, you could have played a drinking game with this episode where you just take a drink every time a Bantha or a Tuscan dies because a lot of them. Yeah. Die. Yeah. Which was, but, it was hard to see them battle the crate dragon because each time for me, at least when somebody died, I'm like, Oh no, like it hurt for me because I felt for the characters <laughs> strangely. Like, yeah, it's almost a horror show. They're running away from it so fast. And you know that they're not going to make it half the time. Oh, and I was so worried that the weak way, who was like the token alien character <laughs> in the episode, I was so worried about him for some reason. I like, I said to her, I, like my girlfriend, I was like, so where's the weak way? Did he, he survive? And then at the last sh- shot of like Cobb Vance giving him the armor, they pan past the skeleton and show him there. I was like, good, good. He survived. Like he's, we need that guy. <laughs> It felt like they needed more alien diversity, so they included just that one. <laughs> but yeah. honestly, from what the novels portray Freetown as, which is what I'm calling it because that's what it's called the novels, I honestly, from the novels, thought that Freetown had more alien characters in it. It felt like more of an eclectic mix. Maybe, you know, they spent a lot of money on that crate Dragon design being able to have these amazing shots with the Banthas and Tatooine landscape. But I would have liked to have seen more aliens. That's my one small critique. Her and I were talking about the Banthas themselves. And I think, I feel like they were all digital. Because like when they made the original ones, they were elephants with yes. costumes on. And I think this time he probably just made all digital uh, Banthas. Which... See, I didn't feel that way because when they do those close-ups on the Banthas, it doesn't look like digital technology. It looks like a puppet of some sort. Maybe some of them were the ones that were more to the background. They could throw them in the volume yeah, or create one and multiply it, duplicate it on the screen. Yeah, That's what I was going to say. And like, cause there's that one that was in like the EW picture. Remember that there was like that front facing one. It's in the trailer yes. too. Yes. And I think that they made, probably made one giant one that was life size. And then they just, used it for everything and you kind of you know if you're next to a bantha it has the explosives and stuff on it like my girlfriend was asking she's like so what is the point of riding a bantha those things are so slow well when you play lego star wars the video game you find a bantha in the in the worst level ever through the jugglet wastes it takes so and, long to complete and i was like when you find a bantha in that level it is terrible you can't you can walk faster than those things can remove so i completely understand but for some reason the, the, the tuscans ride them because they're hardy i'm guessing yeah they're tough yeah and i'd rather be riding something than walking especially through the sand if you've ever walked on a beach before it's uneven it's not fun Mm -hmm. it's better just to ride something and obviously they don't have speeders maybe because against their beliefs speaking of tuscan raiders when they opened the water egg thing it was the same noise i swear as the brain invaders from geonosis the worms i thought that they were gonna invade com vance mind and <laughs> i didn't know what was gonna happen there for a second well i'm watching this at 5 a.m in the morning <laughs> they take the, the cave they took them to is actually where queen karina the great is it's a giant tuscan raider <laughs> i'm like in tuscan raider I'm going to ref- yeah I was, I was like i'm gonna refrain from doing a queen karina the great impersonation on this you got to you got by to. my small shred of dignity <laughs> hey i can do it i i can get away with that i do a lot more worse things on uh, here. Yeah. it was cool seeing another side to these natives on the planet because all we had seen before really is them being evil or doing what appeared to oh, yeah. be evil things they attack luke they kill Anakin's mother, and those are brief glimpses, but we get such a better in-depth look at kind of their way of 
thinking. They know they are Raiders, yes, and that's just what they do. The way that Mando talks about them to the Freetown people when he's trying to convince them to go fight the Crate Dragon together. I love that speech because it put you inside the head of a Tusken Raider, which I never thought I would ever get to see in Star Wars. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's what I, we were talking about after we finished the episode. I said it would have been really cool to have, in a certain point of view, they talk about Tuscans will have the spirit that they believe in that wanders through Tatooine. It kills, like, whole tribes because of Anakin killing, slaughtering mm-hmm. that whole tribe. So part of me was like, oh, man, are they going to go here? Like, when he was, like, they were on the campfire, and they were talking about something, I was like, are they going to go to, like, this place where they're going to talk about the spirit of it? Like, I was like, they already brought Anakin's pod racer in this. I don't know. I love seeing the people that believe that's Anakin's pod racer, by the way. That. I do. I do. Okay. So first of all, back to Tuscan Race before I get into Anakin's pod racer engine being a speeder bike for Cobb Vanth. I thought they were going the exact same place that you thought because in the comics, yeah. I don't know if you've read the ones where they're talking about uh, Darth Vader destroying them all. And there's just like a few left because he completely mm-hmm. wiped out a lot of their tribe. They all refer to him as, like you said, the great spirit. And they're all sitting around a campfire when they're discussing that. And I think you even see Darth Vader in the fire from what I can remember. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm making that up. I don't know. I would have loved if they would have explained that a little bit more, but I don't think it would have added anything to the episode. I think it would have just yeah. allowed fanboys like us to obsess over having another oh, Easter yeah. egg. There was enough, way enough fan service in this episode. I agree. I agree. But the difference between that and episode five was I felt like every single time we got fan service, it mattered to the story. Like, having Tusken Raiders there mattered to the story. The Jawas mattered to the story that they saved Cobb Banth, which we see in the novel. Banthas mattered to the story. Hitting bo- hitting uh, the jetpack to make him fly away before the... That was really cool. That was just... <laughs> Did you not like that? I liked that. Because it was so subtle. That was the one moment where I kind of like, interesting move. I, it was It's not something I really love or I really hate. I might I might change my mind in other viewings. It was something that I'm not really, you know, going to die on a hill for. Yeah. Whether I love it or not. But it was an interesting and definitely interesting move. I thought it was subtle enough that people wouldn't notice, except if you're a super fan. And honestly... I didn't pick up on it until I was thinking about the episode afterwards because I was invested in the moment. I was invested in what was happening on the screen with the dragon coming after Mando. And they even panned to baby Yoda when everything's disappeared, like showing you what the consequences of him dying could lead to like this poor child left alone. I thought it was well done. Every Mm -hmm. part of the story I thought in this episode was super well done, including the pod racer. (laughs) um it's just a nice detail and it could be what you want it to be in your head canon until they put it into a visual dictionary that pod racer would be 42 (laughs) years old at this time someone did the math 42 years old it's an antique (laughs) yeah that thing belongs in a museum so (laughs) but you know something like that would have been around if you think about it for a pretty long time considering that was the pod racer that won the boon to eve race by Anakin Skywalker, who was the underdog of the day. It puts more context into it for me. I think it's cool that either way, that's a pod racer engine. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a very different design. It's not just another speeder bike. In the end of the day, for me, that's what's cool is that it's a new design that mm-hmm. it's not something that they recycle or something that looks really not very good. Okay. This to me was the best story that I've ever seen happen on Tatooine. I don't know if you would agree with that. Because it just shows you all that the planet has to offer. And I think it did the best job at showcasing all the creatures and things that we wanted to see. But I don't think that we need to go to Tatooine again for a while because of that. Sounds like you're working for the Tatooine vacation agency. Come to nice sunny Tatooine. We have banthas and trait dragons. Yeah, but I don't need to see any more of it for a while now. I got my oh, fix is what I'm trying to explain. I don't know if you feel yeah, the same I, way. I mean, I, I'm fine with going back and forth. Like I said, I enjoy the char- some of the characters that are there, like Cobb Vanth and Amy Sedaris's character, but I'd be happy to go back. I wonder what's going to happen with Boba. He's just the wandering guy in the desert. Like, And that's what makes me think we will probably. Yeah. Until we, They might wait until season three because we're getting slow inklings of Boba. 
I presume that the mystery character from episode five is Boba Fett now. I think it's safe to say that. I, I personally think it was Cobb Vanth because he was in the armor, but we didn't see Boba Fett's shoes in that yeah. scene. In that, so yeah, could be. I want to know what Boba's up to because he looks amazing. He has a Tuscan Raider staff and rifle. Maybe he's adopted their ways a little bit. That would be cool if he becomes a member of the tribe. Yeah, he looks kind of like, remember that Mythos uh, Obi-Wan Hot Toys figure from a few years ago, like the desert Obi-Wan? Yes, like the backpack yes. And like all that stuff. That's what I was saying. When I saw his back, I was like, oh, wow. Like I was like, he kind of has that like accessories and that kind of stuff. I don't know. Maybe I'm just going crazy. Just seeing the, the, t- the gaffy stick and the rifle. I mean, like. No, I see what you're saying. I can see a resemblance. What I really think when it comes to Boba Fett is something that not a lot of people I think are talking about, which is why didn't he try to get the armor back? The way I look at it is for the character, he's probably had a lot of time to think, right? And realize that the armor is just holding him back. You look at a character like Jango Fett, his father, why does he die? Because the jetpack malfunctions, his armor malfunctions, the technology is too much to use all at once. So Mace Windu kills him. How does he fall into the Sarlacc pit and almost now falls into his demise? It's an almost now, which is really cool to say, just knowing yeah. for sure that he survives. is because his jetpack mal- malfunctions when Han hits him in the back. The technology is what led to him almost being killed. So I think that he realizes that the armor, the jetpack, the technology is something that he should throw away not care about it anymore and that's why he left it for job was to gather and Cobb Vanth to take on as you were saying that I was wondering what is Din Djarin gonna do with Boba's armor now maybe does he take it back to the armorer now and go on Navarro and say here here's another set of armor for you to melt down I don't know exactly what his end game with that is unless he's looking for spare or he's making baby Yodas I don't know I thought when I watched it the first time because I was wondering that same thing I thought that he was going to make it into baby Yoda armor and baby Yoda would just turn into the new Boba Fett Get him a jetpack, please. <laughs> make no, make little just, holes he, for his ears in the helmet. I think yeah, and he's but instead of instead of a jetpack though, he just like force pushes himself off the ground. You know, yeah. that's how he flies through the air. Yeah. Well, that's the beautiful thing about Jedi and their difference between Mandalorians is, of course, we know Mandalorians forged their armor the way that they did and gave themselves so much technology in order to battle the Jedi back during the old Republic era and that's why Mm -hmm. they act the way they do they have jetpacks just like jedi can jump super high so i think that's the difference between like i said technology and relying on it some would call it an over-reliance versus having more of a religion that gives you your power and like mando said in season one weapons are his religion is that going to transition over time you know and i'm fine with seeing what happens there you know it just gives it more context once again well speaking of like looking into the future what do you think is gonna do you have, have any idea where we're, what we're doing next week what's going on no do you think this is gonna be like <laughs> the beginning of last season do you think we're gonna see a three episode arc again no i think we're gonna be off tattooing i think we're gonna see the razor crest going somewhere new next episode if i had to guess i think it might be the either the ice planet where the ship crashes or the water world where he's on a boat or florum to hang out with hondo <laughs> I don't think Hondo's on for him at this point. I have a feeling. No, he's on. He's probably on Batuu, which, you know, they just land in Batuu and then it just becomes like a, it's just a Galaxy's Edge commercial. Where did he end up at the end of Rebels? He was on Lothal the last time we saw him. He wasn't in the, in the epilogue. No. So at at this time, he, I mean, I guess he could be somewhere around, like not on Batuu yet, but he's on Batuu between seven and nine. Maybe he has just a, uh, what's the inflatable pig called from Rebels? Puffer pig. Yeah. Him and a puffer pig are just going on adventures together. Maybe an Ugnaught. I was going to say, not the the Ugnaught. No, they find a puffer pig. Yeah. They need something to carry the Ugnaught around. (laughs) That image in your mind just didn't sit well, did it? I love Hondo though. I, I would, I'd be perfect. Like after seeing the week way in this week's episode, I'd be perfectly happy with seeing Hondo in another, some kind of live action, you know, but we'll see. We'll this see would be happens, a perfect so. opportunity, honestly, for him to show up. Oh yeah. 
in a series like this. They're bringing everyone else in. I, but I've also seen people who think that that's Commander Cody at the end of the episode, this week's episode. So <laughs> I was going to say that, like, <laughs> maybe not Commander Cody, but just like a random clone. <laughs> it's Is actually that not Bokara. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it could be literally any other clone. It doesn't have to be Boba Fett. I think it's safe to say, though, considering that it's command, he yeah. gives that line where Cobb Vant says to Din Djarin, the Mandalorian, tell your people I wasn't the one that broke that. At that line, I was convinced, okay, either we're going to see him in this episode or a future episode. And then as he's going across the landscape, I was still looking at it like, are they going to do it? Are they going to do it? And then I'm like, okay, if, if they're not going to do it, I'm fine with it because we got the beautiful twin sons. It was a perfect image. And then the music quiets a little bit and then swells to Boba. And what's his name? What's Ludwig? Is Tamara that the... Morrison? No, oh, oh. the composer. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ludwig Gore might... something, something, something. Gorig, yeah. Yeah, we're going to put on the screen right now. He did a phenomenal job with the, the music in this episode, I thought. The music swells, then we see Boba turn around, scar on his face, looking pretty epic. Yeah, I also yeah. like the Tusken Raider theme that we got in the music. When they arrived to Freetown, that was pretty cool in the soundtrack. I yeah, think. and it's not just the same thing that they had in A New Hope, which they seem to reuse all the time. Mm-hmm. The Jublin Waste, Bantha Noise. I like seeing which... Mastiffs again. Those were cool. The yeah. Well, that's what, when they when they jumped in, yeah. When they jumped in, I was like, "Oh man, these things are the Tuscans' dog." And, when, and then he started talking. I was like, "Oh yeah, I forgot. He knows how to do all the Tuscan stuff." Which makes me think. Okay, so let me set something up for you. Then I don't know if you noticed this on the first time watching it, but when he's talking to the Cyclops dude at the beginning of the episode, I don't know what his name is. They probably don't even have a name. Unnamed Cyclops is that his name? Just like unnamed Mithril. He's he's dead anyway, so it's fine. Is he though? Maybe he got eaten by the shadow dogs. Maybe that's actually Boba Fett at the end. That's just what he looks like. <laughs> so I, I did want to say it, but I didn't want to jump back. But now that you, you went back in that scene at the very beginning when he shot the Gamorrean, I was just like, what is going on? Like, I was just like, I, I, I genuinely was surprised. Like, I was like, I, we knew yeah. that they all, like, all those guys turn on Din Djarin. When he shot the other, I was like, oh man, I was already, I was getting excited about that fight. The fight was and pretty then, much then, over the, as the side the survivor. Explains. Yeah, the survivor gets into the fight like he's a boss. He just crowd surfs into the bench. I don't know what he was thinking. Like, mm-hmm. did he even consider why he would be jumping into a fight with Mando? Or was he a part of the scheme? Maybe he was in it. Yeah. Oh, and then the bouncer guy just shows up too. I was like, what is going on? But they were all in on it. That's what I have to yeah. think in my head, Cannon. This Gamorrean guard was going to get like 10,000 credits for helping kill Mando. <laughs> well, I, I think I think I do think it's so funny now. I've been I've been listening to some other after we recorded our podcast. I listened to some others on my way on my drives and stuff. It was really funny to me. Everyone talking about the graffiti planet as we as everyone's been calling it and thinking all this stuff like, oh, is it Mandalore? Is it all this stuff? And then it's just this. It's just a simple intro scene. And I I'm perf- I'm so I love it when they do this. Well, we don't need a name. We don't need you know. It almost looks like Sabine's graffiti a little bit with the way the stormtrooper helmets are drawn. And then we see like the creepy wolf looking things in the background, the dogs, which, you know, those are totally wolf, loath wolves, Sam. Don't you know they're all oh, like, I, well, episode? I thought they were the things, I thought they were the things from uh, Pandora in uh, Avatar that, uh, you Pandora? Know, the- Pandora? Pandora. <laughs> with Senator Tucci? <laughs> <laughs> no, James Cameron's Avatar, you know, the, the, the award winning movie. Uh, you know those black six-legged dogs that come in. I was like, oh man, here's here we go, finally an Avatar crossover. Yeah, and they don't, you don't even see what they really look like. You just see the glowing red eyes, which so, I'm I'm a fan of. Why design a new creature that we're gonna, you know? Yeah, and I think that from a story perspective, not knowing what something looks like makes it feel more dangerous. I've heard that with like The Walking Dead, the behind-the-scenes stuff. If you don't see a character die, you just hear them screaming and getting like torn apart by zombies. Your, your mind's going to create like more of a disgusting, terror, terrifying death than they could ever make with makeup and stuff. What I was going to, before we, we love our tangents. I love them. But what I was going to talk about before um, we went off on this was in the beginning when he tells him that he's on Tatooine, I think even before that, maybe, no, maybe it is in that moment. I forget. Or when Mando goes back to Tatooine, I get the vibe that Mando has been on Tatooine for a while and knows about the planet not 
like since we last saw him in season one, but just before we even saw this story with him, I felt like Mando had time to go learn the Tuscan Raider language. It's not new to him. That's just the vibe I get. But then he doesn't know where the town is because if you're on Tatooine, that, that is one of the three main towns, according to them. I, I don't know. I, I do think that maybe they had a covert somewhere there at one point when growing yeah. up. You know what I mean? Because I like they were that. in hiding from such a young age that maybe he had a covert on Tatooine and that's why. Because I wondered that even from season one, why he knew all that stuff from the, about the Tuscan. So maybe they'll explain it. Maybe they'll just put it in a visual dictionary. Or not. Who knows? Yeah, or not. And we can just speculate and do some crazy speculating on it. Yeah. Maybe Mando was a Tuscan Raider at one point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He just traded one mask for another. Yeah, exactly. And he actually Hero. became friends with Boba when he adopted the Tuscan Raider ways. And mm -hmm. yeah, they're best friends, actually. We don't know that yet. <laughs> Next week, folks. What do you think going forward? I mean, for me, seeing Boba in the first episode, seeing Cobb Vanth, the way they did it, perfect execution. I think that all bets are off the table and we could see any character that we were talking about before or maybe even more. Oh yeah, and I am happy with whatever they do at this point. I honestly just, I'm fine with whatever. And I, I want the story to breathe in its own and go places where yes. it needs to go. And I do hear, I understand people's arguments saying that they think that this week's story didn't really advance the plot and didn't advance the characters. In some ways it didn't, but in a lot of ways it showed Mando's ability to like, and reintroduce character people like people who haven't watched this in a year. I mean, there's not there's people like us who rewatch this every two weeks. <laughs> there's people who haven't done that. So you know, introducing him in the pit droids at the beginning, saying that he's forgiven droids at this point. Uh, introducing that was cool. like him in this, that was like him moment. him working with Cobb Vanth and like you know the guy he doesn't like and now learning to like you know. To, I think it was a really good like re jumping into the season into the series again for a lot of people, mm -hmm. just to show like where this character's at and like how he's growing and how he's hostile, but he can also like work with people who are reasonable some people's harshness on it i don't think is completely grounded but i can kind of see yeah i've i've stayed away from reviews and reactions for the most part i haven't oh, yeah. tried to gauge what people are thinking because i want this to be full like just us talking without any other preconceived notions oh, yeah. in my head it was so difficult for me not to watch everyone else's reviews today. Like my <laughs> YouTube feed is filled with other people's reviews, which I'm going to go watch right after we've been thank, this week. This. And thank God we saw the episode. At least I know I did before anybody spoiled it. I was texting you like, holy smokes, look at this. I can't, I can't tell you what I'm seeing, but what I'm seeing at 5 a.m. is fantastic. I honestly was one of those people at first, but talking with you now, my opinion has changed a little bit that thought I didn't get to see enough Mando. I didn't get to see enough character development for him. It didn't feel like it advanced the plot at first. Now looking back, I think what this season is about, and we kind of talked about it last time too, and it's addressed at the beginning of this episode, he's looking for other Mandalorians, right? So other Mandalorians are Sabine, Bo-Katan, people who wear Mandalorian armor. And I think what this season is going to address, what really, and like I said, we did this in season one too, what really makes Mandalorian a Mandalorian. And I think yeah. that a character like Bo-Katan and Sabine, who are Mandalorians, but Sabine's probably a different type of Mandalorian in that sense. She removes her helmet. She doesn't adopt the way. Bo-Katan is probably also in that same vein. Just being a Mandalorian doesn't mean you have to follow all these roles. I think that is the portion of what this season will sort of try to explain. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, I think that's a good observation and sweeping in wide strokes. I think that is a very, I think it's going forward a really mm -hmm. good prediction because who knows, like who knows, but it, he seems to be trending in that, in that general direction towards those Mandalorians. Yeah. But. And I, I do like seeing that the consequences of season one matter for the character mm -hmm. as well. There were a few times, though, in the episode <laughs> that I was really afraid for Baby Yoda. Like, when he just kicks him out of the way at the beginning, or when you have this giant crate dragon which could come out anywhere in the mountains, on the sand, you have Baby Yoda just sitting there all innocent-like. It's very easy for him to get harmed in this sort of situation. And he's, once again, yeah. seeing a lot of violence, 
when he was in the little bowl and peeked his head up. I thought that was the cutest thing in the world. Uh, you mean in the spittoon in the bar? Yes. <laughs> Which is kind of cool. I like to think of, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I look forward to uh, being able to chat some more about uh, next week. And next week, we won't have two two shows in one week, so we'll talk Mando Monday, merchandising on Monday, and then yep. jump into the next episode next on Friday, which is crazy to think about weekly Star Wars again. Yeah, and honestly, I was saying this to someone else today. This is going to sound, I don't mean to sound controversial. I'm more excited seeing this episode and knowing what this series has to offer i'm more excited for it than i was for the sequel trilogy in a lot of ways in a really weird sense we got boba fett back that's the same level as darth maul for me Mm -hmm. if not more because the fans from 1983 who thought boba fett was dead for all this time have their minds blown i just feel like there's so much to offer and we genuinely have no idea where it's going next. It's for an sure. exciting time to be a fan. Oh yeah, for sure. And we uh, to be fans that we saw what we what we've seen already. You know, experience the Force Awakens in high school and work the whole way through now. And yeah, it's been a journey. And like you yeah. said, I'm still still working on the fact that Boba Fett's back and the, not fully dead. But hey, yeah. I'm excited. I'm really I'm really interested to see where they go with it. And uh, I'm glad that we're going to be here with all of you and uh, with you. And we're going we're gonna to work through it together. And to all of our viewers, I really hope that you feel free to leave your comments and predictions in the comment section. And Matt and I have both been trying to work hard in the comment section here to try to keep in contact with you, answer as many comments and reply back to you as we can. You know, yeah. we appreciate your feedback. And when last episode premiered, I was so excited to see that there were people in the premiere. Like that made me like, oh, people actually want to see our podcast. So <laughs> that made me really, uh, really happy. I'm trying to pull up the other episode that we posted. To check out the comments because I want to pick a new segment, <laughs> a, a comment per week. We're just going to pick one. Uh, maybe if there's a couple good ones, we can do more to answer some questions or to talk about fan feedback. <laughs> do we want to read uh, Archie Temple? who said Sam's face is so red he seemed nervous. <laughs> you want to address well, this, Sam? Um, <laughs> Why is your face well, my, so red? How dare you? <laughs> and I can't say I got sunburned. My face is always like this. So um, I think I, I appreciate it. And so, right. I, uh, yeah, it was just, we, I, there was a lot of nerves going into the first show. And I think it was just trying to get out, get the whole show off the ground that we were, you know, we were kind of worried about technical stuff. And I'm glad that we got where we are and, just stick around and you'll see me still stay red, but be less nervous. So, yeah, you cracked a cold one tonight. That's why yours is a little, yeah. little rosy. Somebody also asked from Ronald Reagan, 1985. I, I'm just imagining that this is actual Ronald Reagan <laughs> asking you this question. Reagan smash. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was wondering, have you watched both of the Ewok adventure movies? Have you seen those? Yeah. Yeah, tonight when I was cooking dinner, I saw that they had posted that that comment. My dad loves Ewoks, so I was exposed to those movies early on, but it's hard to find them now. They're yes. they're very elusive. I think I so saw I them remember, once. I don't remember yeah. a thing. Yeah, I remember Ewoks speak English in those movies, and Wilfred Brimley's in it, and Blurgs are in it, and that's just about it. That I can remember because I saw in the gallery episode of The Mandalorian, them showing that footage from the Blurgs and how they that's changed over time and advanced in the way it comes across on the screen because it used to be stop motion animation so i mean i've seen that clip multiple times but i honestly i don't remember a thing i saw it once when i was really really young after i watched return of the jedi at like my friend's house and i don't remember a thing yeah and they used to used to be able to get them at the like video rental stores and now they've kind of just since the buy it since disney bought everything it's they're kind of pushing them away because i don't know if disney owns them so I don't or else i think, think. they that or else they would be on Disney Plus, I think. So that's a maybe. that's a fair point. Maybe we need to go to the last blockbuster that's open and just rate it and get the uh, Ewok Adventures tape. Maybe, maybe I'm sure it's out there somewhere online. It's just like the holiday special. It's been pushed away, but people can still find it. Yeah, yeah. If you try hard enough, you can get anything you want. And everyone, that is today's Clone Wars cookie for the begin for the end of the episode and the moral of today. You can do anything if you try hard enough. Amen. Your, your source of positivity. It's very uplifting. <laughs> Try to do that with my content too. So I'm glad that we can both bring that to this series. For sure. But yeah, for sure. Anything else you want to talk about? 
everything's doing pretty good. I think I think we I think we broke down all we could and dug into everything as deep as a crate dragon. <laughs> and uh, we'll definitely be talking about how this episode relates into future episodes of this series as we go forward because it really is all cohesive and it all is one story. So every bit matters and we will be breaking it all down for you in the future on future episodes. So please subscribe to the channel for more and give us some fan feedback, give us some comments down below. And we will try to answer those on the show or reply to them in the comments. Thanks yeah. for being here tonight yeah. with me, Sam. I appreciate it I appreciate as always. It. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And I'm glad that we have this platform to do this. Exactly. Thank you guys for your constant support. And I hope that you yeah. all have a great rest of your day. May the force be with you always. See ya.